Welcome to Deep Tech 315 Power Edition here, leading off with the Apple event, much anticipated. This, of course, being the new iPhone 16 was the foundation around this and all these Apple intelligence features. I'll start with a recap, then Doug, I'm gonna give you the mic, then I'm gonna end with a final thought on it. In terms of the recap, it was essentially as expected uh, with those new iPhones coming out, slightly bigger screens, the timing of Apple intelligence, Apple came out and gave some specifics around it, but generally I think most of them are coming kind of in the next six months in the US and then be rolled out to other parts of the world throughout uh, the next 12 months. They also have a new Apple Watch, some AirPods that have uh, some opportunity to be used as hearing aids to kind of a nice uh, additional feature and an added bump thought some creativity around some of the other uh, those other two products. But this is really all about the iPhone. And ultimately, this comes down to the central question that keeps coming over and over again is what to expect about the iPhone growth for the next uh, couple of years. And I want to focus on those those two years for uh, the, the front end of this conversation and where the street stands today is that the iPhone revenue will grow around 7% in fiscal 25, around 8% in fiscal 26. Uh, that compares to basically being down 1% over the past year or uh, last two years on average. And so that's kind of the setup. Everybody's talking, how big is the upgrade pool? What's gonna happen? Ultimately, what are these iPhone numbers gonna be? As you're processing all through, where are you coming out? I think it's a pretty good chance that we return to strong growth for FY25. I think that the features are strong enough to push people to go upgrade. I mean, you're going to get better battery life, particularly if you're on an old phone anyway. So there's other reasons I think people might choose to upgrade as well. You get some camera features, et cetera. Um, for me, the question still is about that FY26 number. And FY26 or Apple 27 number? Uh, FY26. So as we get into, you know, what does it look like post having a year now of iPhone with AI? What does it kind of look like in terms of what Apple can do, pull other levers? Like, are there additional AI features they can introduce that maintain this high growth rate, right? Or is it going to have to be more about hardware in that next upgrade cycle? I'm not sure. But I think that's going to be the question that people kind of shift to as we start to see what the unit volumes look like from Apple intelligence. So I've been uh, up to my eyes in terms of the upgrade model over the last couple of days, and we're gonna be releasing some things over the next couple of days around this, but just to kind of give a general preview around this, uh, that the majority of iPhone sales come from upgrades. They'll do in a, a great year, like 230 million units but uh, call it 90% of those come from existing iPhone users. And even though Apple hasn't given out iPhone numbers uh, in terms of the actual units sold for about a decade, and they only give some like abstract comments just around trajectory of average life, is that you can build a pretty good model around what these upgrades look like. And I think one piece that the street is missing at this point as they talk about those seven and 8% growth numbers in the next couple of years, is the size of the pool in fiscal 26. And that specifically is gonna be really playing off of what happened in 21, fiscal 21, because of a five-year upgrade cycle. In fiscal 21, iPhone revenue grew at 39%. It basically took off like a rocket ship. And that of course was related to a lot of other factors, but needless to say is that that has this kind of boomerang effect five years later. And so, for me, the question is, uh, a lot of it is about how much next year, the next 12 months, can they pull some of those people in? And as we've uh, started to do the math around this, if they pull in 8% of the base beyond fiscal 25, so fiscal 26, 27, 28, 29, 8% of that total base, if that gets pulled into fiscal 25, iPhone's going to grow at 15% versus 7%. It gets a little bit better in 26 at 17%. But the music stops in 20, uh, uh, fiscal 27, and we start to go into a decline in iPhone because essentially they pulled so much forward and you have a decline of 5% for a couple of years. And so that's, it's coming more clear to me what this kind of this slope looks like. Very positive over the next couple of years. Some caution as I kind of think about this, it's when is the street going to 
you mentioned it too, the 26, and that's why I question when you talk about 26 or 27. I think fiscal 25, and this is pretty bold to say that iPhone's going to grow at 15 and 17%. That's where I think it's going to be. I think the, the, the knock on that view is that there's also a dark side to that and what happens in 27 and 28. Does that, uh, when you think about the 15 and 17 numbers, obviously the 15 requires some pull forward, right? From that four year yeah, window that we're kind of talking about. Of, yeah, like how, how, how do you then? think about that in the context of then still being able to grow and accelerate even, even though you pulled a, a good amount forward to get that growth we're talking about? Well, since only 10% of the units are coming from new, and I think that the new base, like we're modeling it grows modestly, like three or 5% or some small number, uh, that it's just really all about what's happening with the upgrades and pulling those forward. That's uh, the biggest X factor. And so what this exercise does is it, it illustrates that small changes to pull forward can have both a negative impact. We've seen that in some years where that you extend the, the average life of an iPhone. And when you contract the average life of an iPhone, uh, that can have a measurable impact on the upside too. So I think that uh, as far as like upside and kind of the, the core growth, like we're not modeling that iPhone global market share is going to go from 19 to 24 percent that's mm -hmm. i don't think that that's on the table i just think that uh you know at the core uh what this comes down to is what is your belief in the ability of these features to get people to move forward and that's the piece that's a guess right now i mean we've seen a couple demos that are video demos and and that's why it really isn't going to be until the beginning of calendar 25 until people in the u.s get a real sense about what this product is like and so Admittedly, I'm making some guesses, but the kind of the substance of the exercise is just to show it doesn't take much to have a meaningful impact, uh, much pull forward to have a meaningful impact on iPhone growth. I think you nailed it, though. The, the ultimate question is, are the features compelling enough to get that pull forward? Mm -hmm. Because I think if you kind of just have base uh, and standard upgrade rates, right? Given we have an easier comp now, you go into 25, I feel like that that 7% number that the street's at, that's a pretty easy number to hit, you know, just with a, a typical, I think, upgrade cycle, maybe a little bit more with AI. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's the fundamental question you hit it is, are these features enough? And like you said, we're going to know in about six months whether or not it's true. Love it. Uh, let's jump to our second topic, which is... OpenAI uh, just announced they've uh, done this round. This is the round where Apple was, uh, I don't know if it's confirmed that they were involved with it. I was always thinking it was going to be kind of around that 100 billion-ish valuation. I don't know if that was my own thinking or I was being influenced by what other people were saying out there, but it sounds like the number is 150 billion. I just want to pause there. Is that correct? That's the post-money valuation on this? That's the last number I saw, and I believe it's actually the pre-money valuation. It sounds like they'll raise something like six or seven billion at that valuation. So call it 155, 160, uh, and that's up. That's basically doubled over the past year or so, something like that. Yeah, they did a tender at uh, almost 90, uh, which was earlier this year. So it's up, you know, call it whatever, 60, 70 percent or so from that tender. Over the last nine months. Yep. So, I mean, this has uh, been up into the right. And, you know, just as I I think about this, it, to me, it all makes sense. I mean, it, we think about all the benefit that we've had and the hardware side and the public piece and, you know, the true anointed. AI companies, it's NVIDIA, but it's also, of course, OpenAI and all the things that they're doing and uh, other companies, you know, we're investors in Grok and feel that they've got a, a seat at the table. Like all this, even though it seems absurd to go from 90 billion nine months ago to 150 billion plus, I feel like just given what they're actually building, that it's reasonable. There's actually logic around. I agree with that. And I think there's, there was a quote from Larry Ellison on the Oracle earnings call earlier this week that to me summed up a lot of this. And he said, basically, there's four companies right now that are in the running to create these advanced foundation models. And it's the four that we've talked about. It's OpenAI, it's Google with Gemini, uh, Meta with Llama, and then Grok, XAI. Those are kind of the four horsemen. Everybody else, I think, are, are going to have a hard time competing. And what Ellison said that really stuck out to me was that the entry price to play in the foundation model space 
is a hundred billion dollars over the next few years. So, so basically, I mean, price I, in terms of for an investor to to invest in these companies, or no, for the, the entry it? the entry price for these companies to try to develop the models. He's saying oh, gotcha. each of them, all four of them, are going to have to spend a billion, probably something like a hundred billion dollars over the next four or five years to build their models and keep them cutting edge. What is so Grok raise? Six billion. Oh, which one, Grok? Yeah, Grok? Uh, I believe it was seven. But yes, in, in that ballpark. And so now we're talking about OpenAI raising roughly the same amount. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is these companies are going to have to raise more money, and they're probably going to do it at higher valuations as they right. continue to show improvements in those models. And then obviously Google and, and Meta are self-funding. They might be in the best position. They don't have to go out to equity capital markets and tap it. But right? they don't they get the benefit of the markup either. They're not. I mean, Google in particular, the stock has been frustrating the last uh, month plus. Uh, and so you're right. I mean, I think over time, you know, as maybe investors start to recognize how powerful some of these models are, that Google and Meta in respective ways, I think, are leading in certain components of AI. I think maybe the, the stocks would reflect that. But OpenAI is just a simpler bet. You know, it's pure. It's just, do you believe that they can create a great model? And investors are saying they do. Thought just crossed my mind, like, should Google spin out Gemini to get better? But, you know, still with Google, we're talking two trillion plus kind of valuation or two trillion ish valuation. And, uh, you know, if they split it out an extra 50 billion here and there, probably don't really add up. And it's just so core to everything that they're doing. It's just a fabric. It would be difficult to spin it out. Uh, fleeting idea there. Uh, we'll move on. I'll give you a final word. Is there anything else on just the valuation topic? I like that. We're probably going to see more continued markups across the board in the months to come on these companies. Anything more? We'll see more. And I just put it into context, $150 billion for OpenAI. Their rumored revenue run rate is something around $4 billion, call it right now. So you're talking about 38 times forward revenue. The revenue is growing really fast, but you know, that would put it pretty high up on, on mm -hmm. the echelon in terms of public companies, public software companies at least, and their revenue it's multiples. Gonna, it's four billion in revenue. I mean, they could grow at 100% plus for four years. And that's the bet, right? I think that's the bet. So just to try to put in, I actually don't think 38 times forward revenue. I mean, you say it and in a vacuum, that sounds expensive, I yeah, but I, I actually agree. don't think it's that insane of a price if you do believe in AI. Our final and related topic is OpenAI announced Strawberry. This is their uh, our, their latest model, their kind of O version of the model. So consider it uh, their four model was the base, the most advanced model, I should say. Now it is the Strawberry 4.0. And O one, O one. They changed the name. O one, O one. Excuse me. And they now are. Uh, I mean, this this kind of advanced reasoning piece around it. And um, you mentioned how. Uh, they've tested this. They made it so even uh, even someone who's not a tech person could understand what advanced reasoning is around some of the the testing that they've done around this or having the model take tests. Yeah, they put in the release of the model. They had it do an exam from the International Mathematics Olympiad, and they said that GPT four. I'm not taking so that they, test, by the way. Yeah, I don't know if we'd score that well, but GPT four zero. They scored 13% on this exam, and the new O1 model scored 83%. So, I mean, it's a huge improvement in terms of how it can handle things related to mathematics. And I think that's the bottom line. Like, what is exciting about O1, codenamed Strawberry? It's that this model seems like it can do more uh, reasoning, more advanced reasoning than anything we've seen before in AI. Mm -hmm. Getting closer to that general, eventually super intelligence. I was trying to think, when did 4.0 come out? Probably four to six months ago. Let's say six exactly. months ago. I mean, the curve yeah. is just straight up. Super so. fast. Yeah. But, I mean, and that's the name of the game. That's why we call it an AI arms race. You know, it's, it's that open AI, I think, in particular, is pushing the envelope. But, you know, you, you look just a month ago. I mean, Grok put out their second release. I think it was incredible. A, a huge step up from where it was. And I think they still, they've closed the gap, I'd put, I'd put it that way, in terms of where they came from prior to the funding to now where they are in that kind of tier of four, pretty prominently, in my opinion. Love it. But now we have open AI, and I think you're, you're probably going to hear something. I mean, Google's kind of due to do something with Gemini at this point and get us excited about that again. And that's a wrap. 
Thank you. Bye for now.